Professor Gordon J. Savage was born in Canada and received his PhD from the University of Waterloo in 1977 in the area of graph theoretic models of engineering systems. He is presently a faculty member of and a full professor in the Department of Systems Design Engineering at the University of Waterloo, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. His present research interests are in the areas of modeling, formulation and computer implementation of linear graph models of engineering systems and the design for quality, reliability and robustness in complex engineering systems. He has published over 90 refereed papers and the focus of his ongoing research is to integrate quality and reliability metrics using both mechanistic and empirical models. He has been involved in the study of methodology of design for over 30 years and spent parts of seven years presenting the process of innovation in China. His practical experience in industry and his supervision of the Midnight Solar Car Project give him a unique ability to link the methodology of design, the process of innovation and robust design. He will be conferred the Lifetime Achievement Award of the System Society of India in its forthcoming National Systems Conference, NSC 2010 at NIT Suratkar. Professor Savage. Uh, good morning. So the uh, talk will be on the uh, graph theoretic field model for uh, spatial continue and uh, con continue, and this is some uh, work that uh, I did uh, uh, well 30, a large number of years ago now. So we'll uh, see what we can learn from this. So the uh, motivation uh, for this talk uh, actually came from a abstract by, I guess it was uh, the abstract by the previous paper. And the outline of the talk would be, uh, first of all, I'll look at models of physical systems based on uh, uh, graph theory. And that will kind of give the uh, foundations for the, the main work I want to present on the graph theoretic field model. Uh, what's interesting is that the second talk will be the theory of multi-terminal representations and uh, you'll see an interesting application of that as, as we go on into the talk. And <clears throat> then we'll come to applying the uh, graph theory to, to uh, field and continuum problems. And uh, after that we'll look at some applications and show that the graph that theoretic field model does have some very interesting uh, uh, fundamentals to it. So looking at uh, models of physical systems essentially from uh, a graph theoretic basis, we see that there are only two types of measurements, and sometimes you mix, mix up the term measurements and variables, and uh, they would be the through measurement and the typical ones from uh, kind of, I guess, uh, mechanistic models would be current and force and fluid flow and even heat flow and we saw some further ones uh, earlier today. Across measurements, they're fairly classical too. We have the voltage and electrical, velocity and mechanics, uh, pressure in, in fluids and temperature in thermodynamic and thermal problems. And uh, they're, uh, they're quite interesting. The next important feature is that every model has two parts, models of components, and that's really what we mean by a system. It's an interconnection of components given some excitations and we get some response. And then we get the models of the pattern inter interconnection. There are only so many types of components and they typically fall under the following uh, six classes. The sources or loads where we can, can fix some of, the, some of the measurements as desired. The dissipative where energy is being uh, released as heat. Storage where we're either saving energy or releasing energy. Uh, transformers, which typically in a particular process move energy from one part of the, the process to another part. And the well-known applications would be gears in rotational mechanical where we're trading off uh, torque for angular speed. And then there's the good old lever where we're trading off uh, displacement or length for, for force. Uh, the transducer, uh, it's the common component for moving energy from one discipline or process to another process. So the electrical DC motor is an, an example of that, or moving energy from the electrical domain into the rotational mechanical domain. And also we can add in the amplifier, where we're bringing in energy from the environment and putting it into the system or taking it out, uh, taking it out as required. So in terms and of the, the component models, there's the, there's the group we have to work with. In terms of the interconnection uh, model, we have two rules. 
the vertex postulate, which constrains the, the through measurements or through variables, and the circuit postulate, which will constrain the across measurements. And it all sounds pretty simple, and it should. Uh, that's, that's the kind of the beauty of the graphic field model. It starts with this and, and moves on. And uh, see how we go from uh, the general idea of a system to, to graph theory. Let's look at the nature of a complementary pair of measurements and then at the abstract representation. What we first do is um, pick uh, two terminals. Uh, with res with, usually with respect to a, a component. So in this case, we can pick A and B. And then the across measurement is made in parallel with the terminals, component body, and well, the first terminal component body and the other terminal. So A, component body, and, and B is in, in parallel. The through measurement is made in series with the two terminals and the body, as we can see in the uh, as we can see in the diagram. So there's x, y in parallel, and there's y1, the through, through, through meter in, in series. Now, to get into an, an abstract symbol so we can look at any, uh, any system we wish, we can replace the terminals with nodes, the circles, and looking at the polarity of the measurements, which in this case we've tried to get to agree to be either both positive or both both negative, we can represent them by an oriented line segment, sometimes called an edge. And then we just put a put a number number on the edge, and that represents the complementary pair of measurements. This symbol, of course, is called the terminal graph, in the sense that it measures for, uh, me the measurements are made with respect to terminals. The component model uh, has a uh, has a postulate, and uh, I guess I can read it off here. And it says that an N-terminal P process, so P processes, two processes, but be say electrical, mechanical, can be completely characterized by N minus P, com uh, complementary pairs of measurements, represented by a terminal graph that has the topology of a forest or a tree in each part. And that's saying a little more than we need to say. If we look at the, the example, and just look at the yellow, the process, we'll call this process one. It has two, two terminals, and therefore we can just say n minus one for that, which would be one, and there's, there's the terminal graph. <clears throat> for the second, or the, the blue, blue process, uh, let it have the single process, have three terminals, and three minus one is two, and there's the pair of complementary measurements, in this case formed as a tree. Uh, for each of the edges in the terminal graph, we require an equation. So in this case, we have three edges in the terminal graph. We need three equations. It's very simple. And these equations are written in terms of the complementary measurements or variables for each of the two processes. So there we have um, three, and there's our three equations. So one equation for each edge. Now, the interconnection model is uh, interesting. So we look at two pieces here. The system graph arises from the interconnection of the terminal graphs at the nodes uh, corresponding to the interconnection of the components at the terminals. And so a little example here. We have a number of components. C1 has two terminals, B and E. And there's its terminal graph, C2 two terminals, there's its terminal graph B to C, same for three, and four and five is three terminals, so it has the, has the terminal graph with two edges, four and five. Now, this time maybe we could uh, talk a little bit of uh, graph theory, since this is now the system graph, and it's just an example of an oriented uh, line linear graph. And in terms of some of the graph theory, we can talk about paths, which is a set of edges starting at a particular node and ending up another node. So going from B to C, the path would be four and five. Another subgraph of interest are, are circuits, and basically we start on a particular node and go around in a loop. So we can talk about a, a, a circuit as so a subgraph four, five, and two. And the simplest circuit would be just uh, two edges, say a five and three. Uh, we can also talk about a subgraph uh, called a cut set, and the cut set is a set of edges when removed divides the graph into two parts, 
or in the simple sense, segregate the nodes into two distinct sets. So if we take out 2, 5, and 3, for example, then we leave node C and another part with, with uh, nodes B and, and C. And uh, another example, we could cut through 1, 4, 5, and 3. If we take this out, we leave E and a set of nodes at the top, B and C. Uh, if another uh, graph is called the, the tree, and it's a subgraph that uh, joins all the, has a path between all the nodes, but has no circuits. So a tree could be the edges uh, one and two, and they're indicated in, in, in bold. The uh, edges in, and this is interesting, but the edges in the tree are called branches, makes sense, and the edges in the co-trees are called chords. And so graph, graph theory is uh, quite a, an interesting, interesting area, especially in some of, some of the naming. <clears throat> Once we in, introduce the idea of a tree, the remaining edges are, are uh, the chords called the, the co-tree. Now we can talk, we talked about cut sets and circuits, we can talk about fundamental, fundamental cut sets. A fundamental cut set has one branch and some Chords. So there's a fundamental cut set there, two. There's the branch, five and three. And the other fundamental cut set would be one, four, five, and five and three. And the same sense that we can talk about fundamental cut sets, we can talk about fundamental circuits. So it has one chord and some branches. So we have five, one, and two represents a fundamental uh, circuit. Now, in terms of the equations, it's interesting. So we come down to the interconnection equations. Let's talk about the vertex postulate. It simply says that the oriented sum of the three measurements implied by the edges in a given cut set is zero at any instant of time. So looking at what we mean by this, uh, this orientation, if we look at uh, fundamental cut set two, which has two uh, chords, five and three, if we let the branch be the defining orientation, C is the reference, so we see this, we, this could be Y2, and 5 opposes, so that would be minus Y5, Y3 opposes, or is out, so that would be minus Y3. So we have Y2 minus Y5 minus Y3 is equal to 0 in the instant of time. The other fundamental cut set involves branch 1, and it would cut with the chords, the other chords 4, 5, and 3. And again, we can form the cut set equation by we have looking at the the notation here. We using e as the reference. We have y1 plus y4 plus y5 plus y3 is equal to zero since they all have agreed with the orientation of the branch. So we, we can write these cut set equations in a matrix form. And if we pull out the vector y, the the through, through measurements, we get the fundamental cut set, cut set uh, uh, matrix. And in essence, that's called, these are called fundamental cut set equations for a very simple reason. The fundamental cut sets have one branch, and one branch only, and there's only so many of those. Any other cut set has more than two branches, so there would be a, a non-fundamental cut set with it contains one, four, and two. It's got two branches in it. Well, it turns out that once you have the fundamental cut sets, any other cut set is just a linear combination of the fundamental. So the fundamental cut sets form the basis. That's all the information there is in terms of the vertex postulate. The same for the, look at the circuit postulate over here. The oriented sum of the cross measurements implied by the edges in a given circuit is zero at any time. So for each of the chords, we can form a fundamental circuit. So there's four with one, so in this case, what we could do is looking at the four set, the orientation, so this would be, say, x4, and this is this opposes the direction, so this is minus x1, so we have x4 minus x1 is equal to zero. And we do the same for, for five, we go around, uh, one opposes two agrees, so we can put the plus and minus for the cross measurements in the same for three, and so we end up with three. We put these in a set of equations and put them in a matrix form. We bring out the, the cross measurements x. We get the so-called fundamental circuit matrix. And it's fundamental in the sense that any other, any other circuit will have two chords, and that's a, a linear combination of the fundamental ones. 
So all the, the interconnection equations is contained neatly in the fundamental cut set equations and the fundamental circuit equations. There isn't any more interconnection equa any, any more interconnection information then. Now, in the material I'm going to uh, address later, uh, another set of topological equations will come out, and they called the vertex equations. And, and these these equations, all we do is look at any node and form what they call the, the a, a nodal cut set. So a nodal cut set for B would be one, four, and two. And usually the orientation is such that incident away is plus, and incident towards is negative. So in this case, they're all incident away. We could do one for C. In this case, we would have uh, plus minus minus y2 plus y5 plus y3 is equal to zero, and that's that's the the, the nature of that. And these are also broke up into the same number of equations n minus p. So in this case, for for cut sets, we're going to get two for one and two, and for the vertex equations, we're also going to get we can get one for b and for c or for c and e and so on. We just need two. They're not as elegant, but we'll see that they're easy to, to form and uh, will be applicable later. The matrix here is called the incidence matrix, and it just gives some of the inf top, topological information on the, uh, on the, the, the graph. Uh, another set of e equations which are in nature of the circuit partial are the neural transformation equations. In this case, we introduce some extra uh, cross measurements in the following sense. We pick a reference, and then we make extra measurements across measurements, in this case, B to E, for example, and C to E. Then all of the across measurements in the graph can be made as combinations of the, these uh, nodal across measurements. And it turns out that the relationship can be written as the transpose of the incidence matrix. Uh, we add some information, but we get a very simple, uh, simple result. Now, there's a little, as we saw in the uh, previous speaker, there's a little more information which we can pull out of the uh, pull out of, out of our hat here in uh, graph theoretic models. And that is the following. The vertex partial and the circuit partial imply the principle of orthogonality that has units of power or quasi-power. Note only two relations are necessary. Now, what, is, what we're saying is that if we postulate the postulate the vertex postulate, and we get a set of three variables that satisfy this relationship. And in the the, uh, the cross instance over here, in the cir circuit postulate, we get a set of across measurements that satisfy this relationship. Then we automatically have that the vector of the cross measurements times transpose times the vector of the three measurements is equal to zero at any instant of time. In other words, this is just the scalar product, and this is the this is also the so-called system power. So the system power, uh, or quasi power, depending upon the units. If, if that's zero at any instant of time, uh, integrate that integrate the system power over time. We get units of energy, and so what it says then is that looking at two times t1 and t2 is that the change in energy is equal to zero. So in other words. The vertex postulate and the circuit postulate imply conservation of energy. Amazing. And it turns out that we can pick any two of any two of these relationships and use the Messier interconnection model. So we can pick the um, principle of orthogonality and the circuit equation, and we'll see that this this will give us the uh, uh, fundamental uh, cut set equations. Now, another thing that's interesting about this principle of orthogonality is that you can, you can pick a set of three measurements at, any, at some instant of time, say t1, and you can pick the set of across measurements some other time, say t2. And because, of, because they're only topological related, the, the, the uh, scalar product will, will, be, will still remain zero. In fact, if you have two systems with the same graph, so they're topologically similar. You can take the set of, a cro of three measurements from one system and the set of cross measurements from another system. So this might be currents, and this might be pressures. And again, you'll see that the scalar product of those, those two vectors <laughs> will be zero, just because it's a topological phenomena. And it goes back to the, the cut, fundamental cut set matrix and the fundamental circuit matrix. It's one of the amazing things about these linear graph theory models.
<coughs> system equations. Again, we need the three sets of equations. So we have, uh, if we have a system graph with E edges and we have two E measurements. And lo and behold, what do we get? We get E co component equations. Remember I said that the postulate was we get one equation for each of the edges in the terminal graph. We get N minus P fundamental cut set equations. And then we get what's left over, the fundamental circuit equation, and add them all up, and what do you get? So we've got all the information there is in the system. So these, these equations, that's it. Now, something else which is important we'll talk about later is this idea of formulations. And this is the substitutions of the system equation. And you, to get a, a smaller, more interesting, or more useful set. So you can start with the fundamental cut set equation, substitute the component equation, substitute part of the fundamental circuit equation, and we get down to a smaller set of equations. That's what we mean by formulations. Now, this, uh, uh, we'll, you'll see how I apply this later on, this uh, uh, multi, multi terminal representation theory. And the, the, the original, the original uh, need for the approach was they were, they were trying, we were, well, I guess it was there, it was before me, they were trying to solve a large problem through the sum of a number of small problems. So if we look at this representation here, we see, say, th three repeated subsystems. Each subsystem has the same internal, internal structure. And the idea is fairly, fairly simple, is uh, let's pull out one of the subsystems. And this is conceptually, of course. You pull it out, and you look at it. We have the terminals of interconnection A, B, C, and, and D in this case. So we have four. So going back to the component postulate, what do we need? Well, we need a terminal graph that has four minus one, one process, edges in, in, the, in, the, in the terminal graph. Well, there it is over there, it is over there for example. Now, the next thing we can do is uh, let's use the internal structure to see if we can get information uh, at, at, at excitation. So we'll put on some excitations, and some, these are like sources, and we'll put them on with the same topology as the system graph we chose. So if we can go back, we can see, go back, we can see we had uh, one was A, A to, to D, and B was two to D, and what did we, we choose? Sure enough, there's a one, there's excitation one, two and three in the same topology as the system, the uh, terminal graph for the multi-terminal representation. Now, let's look at how we get the equations here. And, and this is a little redundant, but it's, it, it's in a form that I want to use later. So what we'll do is we'll look at the principle of orthogonality for uh, the excitations and the internal structure and also the, the excitations on the, the, the uh, multi-terminal representation. So when we move information to the, from the left side to the right side, we have the total sum, then we change the sign. So what we can see here is there's the principle of orthogonality for excitations and the multi-terminal representation, and there's the principle of orthogonality for the excitations and the substructure. And what we're interested in is, of course, this relationship here, and the minus sign disappears. So what I want to do then is try and get a relationship between y and this, this x here. So what we'll do then is use the internal, internal structure. And, and the way I, I'm going to do this is a little clunky. We wouldn't normally use this, but I say it, it's going to be to my advantage. So we'll substitute the terminal equations, and I've left to put a bit of source on here. Use this nodal transformation. So we bring in this, this set of, of nodal, uh, nodal cross values. And then we started getting this, this nice product in here. So we just keep this guy on the side. And these substitutions give us the, this little piece here. And this be more for like the, uh, the uh, uh, conductances. And this is for the sources. Now, I'm, I'm kind of cheating here a little bit. We will solve out the internal structure. And I get a relationship between all these nodal measurements and basically the excitations, which are the multi-terminal across variables. When we substitute this in, we get this long matrix multiplication in, in both terms here. But this little, this term in the middle here is important. We'll call that G. And that takes care of the conductance properties of the subsystem. And here we have N transpose A, et cetera, et cetera. It takes care of the sources. <coughs> now, 
since on both sides we have this X transpose sitting out in front, and it's arbitrary anyhow, so we pull that out, and lo and behold, to make sure this identity works, we must have Y is equal to GX plus any source information. I'll come back to this in, in a little bit and show you how, how we use this. But again, there's the use of this uh, principle of orthogonality. Now let's look at the, the field problem for the second half of, of this talk. And the, the problem is, well, in a nutshell, there, there aren't any components, so it's not easy to put together a nice little system and, and get, get some information. So I've looked at a couple of simple continuum or field problems here. And the first is the uh, thermal problem. We have a temperature, some boundary conditions insulated, and another temperature. And we have heat flow. And of course, we have a temperature distribution over all this. We'll let this be a two-dimensional problem. We have a temperature distribution all over this continuum. And it's difficult to find unless the, the geometry and boundary conditions are simple. And here we have charge distribution in some different mediums. And again, uh, we have an electric field. And again, it's hard to find the electric field unless we have some simple structure, simple geometry, and so forth. And down here, we have windings and magnetic flux, magnetic field. And again, unless things are simple, it's difficult to, to find the magnetic field. So what we should do then is look at this in terms of a, a systems, systems modeling approach. And let's put some components in here and build up a network. And then we'll solve that. At least we'll find out temperatures and flows at a certain finite, uh, finite locations. And that's, 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 that's what we're going to do. So we'll get the graph theoretic field model. Again, this is for a spatial con continuum salient steps, and th this is an interesting point here too. I want to point out, this is a, what I call a direct discrete approach. We haven't started with any partial differential equations or any functional. We're going to go right in and look at the physics and build a model. And then I'll show you later that our model is correct because in the limit, we get the, your classical partial differential equations and, and functionals. So the secret is, and this is nothing new, but we did dis dis discretization, of the discretization of the spatial continuum according to an orthogonal coordinate system. And rectangular is the easiest. Uh, some arbitrary ones are also possible. Identification of the so-called through and across variables of a specific field. OK, I'll show you, show you examples of that. Formation of the field graph based on steps A and B. And we pretty well know that it's going to be uh, uh, repetitious and routine, so that's not going to be too difficult. We just have to do it in a systematic way. Construction of constitutive equations. And this uh, models the it, kind of the flows and uh, nodal differences inside the, uh, pardon me, potential differences inside the continuum, and boundary conditions, and in terms of the through and across variables. Okay. And at the end here, we compilation of the interconnection equations from the field graph invoking the vertex asserted process. Well, there we have it, the idea of you can see the idea of components coming and the idea of the interconnection coming. So spatial discretization, and we, we do this in a, a, a special way. We have both a, a, some primal uh, discretization and some dual. And so what we see here is a set of primal points in bold, and we can connect those by primal lines. And looking at four primal lines, we have a primal area, and give that some depth, we have a primal volume. The dual is kind of interlaced in between those primal points and connecting the primal, primal points, primal lines. And looking at region here, we get a, 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 pardon me, a, a dual line. And inside here, we have a dual area. Give it some thickness, and we have a dual volume. And we'll look at two-dimensional situations. So we'll, we'll give areas will be length times uh, length of some of the uh, lines t times the thickness. Uh, it's a little easier to, to look at some of the uh, limiting cases if we just stick with the rectangular structure. So here we have the primal points along one rever uh, horizontal axis and also along the uh, uh, vertical axis. And the same for the dual information. You can see how it's a nice regular structure. And so here we have, a, say, a dual length, and here we have a primal length. OK. Now, through and across measurements, remember we go back to the basic idea that we need 
through the Zen series and the uh, uh, crosses uh, in, in parallel. So looking at, what we'll do is, is start with the simplest, we'll look at some um, uh, primal points, and this would be the, say, the dual surface that sits uh, halfway in between or partway into it. What we'll do then is, there's the across measurement, terminal node uh, point to point, it's in, it's in parallel, and there's the through, it's in series, with the, with the uh, points or terminals, and that's through the, in this case, through the dual, dual area. And we can also look at a, a, a and we'll see this serves, this serve, these measurements serve well, look at modeling the constitutive properties. In terms of sources, we can look at a pair of um, uh, prime, uh, primal point, primal points and talk about a flow into the dual volume, and there's the cross measurement in, in parallel with respect to the pair of points. Now the field graphs, uh, again, if we look at what we have here, we have, um, here we have the uh, primal points replaced by nodes and there is a, a, a primal, primal edge, a pr primal terminal graph, for example, and we can see another primal, primal. And then in green we have the duals and the, the duals are the, the nodes for the duals are the, would be the dual points. And the, again, this, the, we have a flow measurement across a primal surface and measured across is measured with respect to the, to the dual points. And we're, we're a little careful though, we'll take the primal edge and we always turn it uh, clockwise to, to get the dual. And as you can see, there's two rotated clock, uh, clock, uh, clock, clockwise, three rotated clockwise, and then there's four rotated. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind that there's this bit of a system to that. Comport models, the comport models, remember the two parts, there's the uh, terminal graph and the terminal equation. So looking at the, what they call the constitutive property, we'll look at, uh, let's say, uh, three primal points, and there were the measurements. There's the terminal graph, <coughs> and this measures, say, a through and, a, and across, a flow and a a potential difference, and since the terminal graph has two, two edges, we need two equations. So there's, say, the, a f uh, the pair of flows and a pair of uh, potential differences, and this is, the cons this is how we build the constitutive coefficient, and it's quite simple. There is the material property, there is the dual area, and it's divided by the length of the primal. And so what we have is kind of a, a bulk of taking the area over, we have an, a, 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 an intensive variable, and taking the across, which is the, uh, like a potential difference, and dividing that by L, we have kind of an approximation for the gradient. So it's quite simple, but very elegant. And these terms here would be, would come into play with asterisks in case we have some coupling, yes, in a, say, a, an isotropic material. For the source model, there's our couple of point, uh, dual, dual volume, there's the terminal graph. In this case, we just specify the flow, uh, for example, the volume times the density, straightforward. And uh, we built these models based on the primal graphs, but we can also do this for the dual graph as well. So interconnection equations. So here we see a little snapshot of the field, and again, we're just working in two dimensions. So here we have the terminal graphs for the constitutive properties, one, two, Three, O3 three and 4, and for example, there's the terminal graph for a source. And the vertex equation yields, so if we just do it, look, just do a normal cut set. And an incident towards is minus, incident away is positive, so we get minus Y1, minus Y2, plus Y03, plus Y04, and there's the source, minus Y03 is zero, simple. Now, in, in the other case here, let's, there's the pair of across measurements, x1, x2, and let's introduce these ideas of these nodal variables, nodal cross variables, we'll call them phi j, phi e, and phi f. And now we can see some simple circuits here, e, g, f, e, where it's e, g, f, e, and that translates into the simple equation here, or we can pull out x1, and there we have, that's basically that idea, the nodal transformation equation. And the same for the circuit e, g, E, G, uh, J, E, and that gives, that'll finally gives X2 is equal to the nodal uh, measurements phi J and 
difference with, with phi e. Application. So let's look at a few things. You know, we'll do uh, heat transfer, heat conduction. It's a scalar potential problem. And what I want to show you is that how we can get from the graph theoretic field model the finite difference method, and then take it on. And we simply get the partial differential equation in the limit. And we'll also look at how we can view the finite element method from the uh, uh, graph theoretical field method. And again, the in the and in the limit, we get the functional. So the partial differential equations are this typical starting point for finite difference, and functionals are the typical starting point for the finite element. But we're direct discrete, so we can bypass that. And then we'll look at electric and magnetic fields, electrostatics and the and uh, magnetostatics. So heat transfer, we'll do heat conduction. We'll do this in two dimensions. And uh, what we see is, um, through and across variables. The, the, these, are, these are well known, so the through is, is heat, whoops, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, here, is a heat flux, you should call it Q in watts, and temperature difference in, in degrees. And obviously their product isn't, uh, isn't, isn't power because we already have power. So here we show the terminal graph for the constitutive properties, one, two, oh, three, and, and four. And there's, there's the, uh, heat flux measured across the dual dual area, temperature measured across between the primal nodes. That's straightforward. And here's a, uh, a a flow source coming in. The component equation is constitutive. It, it follows what we said. There's the there's the heat flow, there's the temperature, there's the conductance, uh, heat conductance constant, there's the area of the dual surface, and there's the link between primal points. For the source, we have a, a flow, which is the volume times, say, a density. Interconnection equations, we just back up, we can see that looking at the, the vertex postulate or the nodal, nodal cut set equation at E, and we get, we get quite simply uh, plus Q3 plus Q04 minus Q1 minus Q2 minus Q2 is equal to zero. And for the circuit, E, F, E, G, H, so we're going around the circuit here, F, E, G, H, and we can see we're going to get um, T, T1 minus T2 minus T3 plus T4, and sure enough, that's, that's what we get at, at shown at, at the bottom here. Why not difference method? Okay, so let's just look at E, consider no E, and we'll start with, we'll start with the nodal cut set equation and substitute in the uh, constitutive equations. And so Q1, Q1, there's the con constitutive uh, coefficient times T1, con constitutive coefficient, so forth. And then we just move the heat source over to the right-hand side. Now, bringing in the nodal potentials, so T1 can be replaced by T1 is replaced by uh, E F phi phi F minus phi E, and so forth. So there's the replacement for uh, T O3. There's the re replacement for T2, and replacement for T O4. And <coughs> if we uh, we can simplify this by in introducing uniform geometry. Uh, delta X is delta Y, and so these terms here cancel out, cancel out. And this all simplifies down to a very simple term in terms of the nodal temperatures in this case. There's the conductance. We get four times the temperature at phi E minus temperature at F, E, and one, and that's just equal to the, the source term on the right-hand side. If we repeat this for all the, all the nodes, then we get simply a set of equations we can solve. So let's go to the Poisson's equation, which is going to be the limiting case of the nodal formulation. So if we start with the, this is the nodal formulation here, we've got it down into these nodal temperatures. Now, <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll let these differences become small, so we can see that if we introduce a potential function, then this different, any difference in, in delta phi is just using first order um, Taylor series, we get the partial derivative times a little bit of, bit of space here. 
So when we substitute this in and be a little careful, we get a difference in derivatives and a difference in derivatives in both in the x direction and in the y direction. And the, the um, uh, geometry will take care of itself. We get a cancellation of delta x's, but when we introduce the Taylor series, we get another delta x back. And same over here for the y dimensions. And finally, in the limit, we get the partial differential equation with respect to the temperature. And this is simply Poisson, Poisson's equation. Or in vector calculus, we get the divergence of the gradient is, is equal to minus the term on the right-hand side. Didn't have to start with this. <laughs> Okay, let's look at the, uh, well, we're in, in, in thermal systems. Let's, let's look at the finite element method. We've seen finite difference from graph theoretic field model. Let's look at the elements. So what, 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 here's how we think of this. There is the field, it's a continuum. And what we'll do is, the thinking is, let's break it up into elements. So these are these contiguous little areas here. Again, we'll think of two dimensions. Now, this element, interconnects actually at, at infinity of terminals, and that's, that's not what we want to deal with. We, we want it down to a small number of terminals. So the simplest number of points or terminals of interconnection would be four, and that would be at the corners. And so we have, have a component one here interconnecting with another component here, and then these, these all look the same. So let's look at the model for this from multi-terminal representation theory. So. Let's take the um, four, four points of interconnection. We'll call those terminals. And we'll also introduce a fourth terminal, which will be at the reference point. And we introduce that in case we have sources, which, which will be based, which be referenced from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the data in here. So we have, what do we got? We got a five terminal component, one process. So for the terminal graph, we need these four edges form a tree. Beautiful. Now we need the terminal equation, so we'll just look at just the constitutive relationship, and, and so we have the two measurements based upon the terminal graph here. We want to re want to relate that to the to the cross measurement. And what we'll do then is let's look at the G as being this 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 uh, this product this multiple product form here. So there's the this A is topology, C is constitutive characteristics, and, and N is going to be this this tough one, this relationship. So let's go into the element and, and put in the pieces of the graph theoretic field model. So here we have the spatial discretization, and the, the key here is I pushed in the dual point, uh, the dual points just so they'd be inside the surface so they kind of kept all. So the element information is all kept together, and we do this all the way around here. Now we see uh, dual dual lengths, which would be dual surfaces, primal, and on and on and on. And now looking at the terminal graph of the constitutive properties, there's the field graph. So there's the pair of complementary variables, uh, safe flow and temperature difference based upon information here. Now, we can also look at this, the topology of our little field graph, and this gives the incident matrix. So there's the nodes, and there's the, the edges, and we get the relationships. So that takes care of, that takes care of the, the matrix A. Okay, we're doing well. We're getting there. So let's go down to getting to the geometry. And there's this simple way to do this. If we go back, we can see that all elements are defined by a coordinate system alpha beta, which runs from min minus 1 to, to plus one, so it's like a little two by two region if you think of it in, in, a, in a rectangular region. So all elements will have this. So you build these weights based upon whatever, whatever your alpha and beta has to be, four weights, and then we can use the, and use the global information, U and V, at, at the terminals of interconnection to give us what the coordinates of the uh, uh, primal and dual points are. And so there's, there's the U, and there's the V, and then primal lengths and dual lengths are just related to the primal and dual points, so we can take care of that. We can take the conductance and then the geometry and build our, our uh, constitutive coefficients for the 12 little uh, uh, constitutive components, and that builds a nice little matrix. So that takes care of the C matrix. Okay, we're doing really well. Now we need N. 
Now, n is typically the, the tough one to get, but what we'll do is instead of solving out the interior, we consider an interpolation function. That, say the temperature temperature uh, profile over the element will be fairly regular, fairly fairly simple, fairly fairly uh, well not known, but uh, but routine. So we use what they call an interpolation surface. It ensures the circuit postulate is satisfied along interconnecting surfaces, but we may err on the vertex postulate. So for our elements, we use the same weights that we use for the geometry. And for example here, we can find out that the temperature at B is related to temperature at A half, temperature at C half, and you can see that's pretty straightforward. So notice we've, we have, we've, we've got this matrix N basically free. So now we can form, now we form the coefficient matrix G for our, for our element or our multi-terminal representation. And now what do we do? So we've got, we now have a model for the element. We interconnect the elements. It's like just interconnecting all those multi-terminal representation. And we solve the problem with, with elements now. And functionals, what we can do is the uh, same thing as we did before, do a small, re small region. And the, based upon the principle of orthogonality, the functional uh, can be written as this matrix product. I pulled left C by itself. And in more detail, we, we find out that this, this guy here is just a difference in these, uh, these temperature differences. And since this is the transpose, this column becomes a row. There's the matrix C. And putting this all together and taken to limit, we get our functional, which is this integral of derivatives, first order derivatives squared over the whole element. So it's now a, a, an area property. Uh, looking at uh, electrostatics, what we need is the primal graph, uh, primal lengths, dual areas, and dual volumes. So I've taken a little snapshot again here. And the through and across variables are rather interesting. The across is, is, is straightforward. It's just the electromotive force in, in volts. And you more readily see this as uh, related to the electric field and uh, spatial length. The uh, through is, is rather interesting. It turns out to be the polarization flux, and it has units of charge. And looking at it more in, in the electric field domain, so there's the polarization. And times dA, of course, dot dA gives us, gives us the, the flux. Now, suppose we have a, a problem where we have a line of charge coming out at us. So we, so we get an electric field in just two dimensions, and we'll let this be a source, this charge here be a source. Then moving on, we get the constitutive. Constitutive equation is just the polarization flux times the uh, permittivity of free space, and this is the dielectric constant. There's the area length, and there's the cross variable. So it all falls into to that pattern. And the source will just be a charge based upon some geometry and some density. Interconnection equations for the dual surface around uh, E, the charge QT, the vertex possible. This should be just the sum of six for these two-dimensional. And for the circuit, we can get uh, e, the, um, the sum difference of the EMFs as shown. And we see that those uh, vertex equation is just a discrete representation of Gauss's law for electricity. And so there's the Gaussian surface relationship. And for electric field from charge, the circuit equation just gives us the relationship for a circuit of uh, electric field and displacement. So let's, let, uh, let's say we have a electric current coming vertical to the uh, perpendicular to the screen. And we'll let this be uh, the two-dimensional field plane. Uh, what I'm going to do here without explanation is uh, indicate that the through and across variables for the magnetic uh, domain or the magnetic flux in units of Weber's and, and the magnetomotive force in units of ampere turn. This H here is the magnetic field intensity. <coughs> And the constitutive relationship, again, has the same form, flux, uh, permeability, area, length, and the cross, cross measurement. Now, notice how we, what we're using is the, we're going to use the dual graph for the magnetic variables. So there's the, there's the flux, and there's the magnetomotive force, round and round. 
The, the trouble is it doesn't give us anything. It doesn't give me anything useful. So what I'm going to do, what we do, is let's use, let's use the dual of the dual, or it becomes the primal for the, for the magnetic variable. So we keep the current in the primal domain. And now there's, there's the, the dual for the magnetic variables for one, and there's going to be the dual of the dual, which is the primal for two, and et cetera, et cetera. So what happens, <laughs> what happens when, you, when you go from uh, dual to primal to primal to dual is the, the, state, the, the relationship of the variable switch. So now flux switch was through, and the dual now becomes cross in the primal, and the EMF, which was cross in the dual, becomes through in the primal. Okay, now let's write the vertex equation at E then. So vertex equation at E is looking at this. There's the there's the through there's there's V O three. It's positive. V O four is away. It's positive. Uh, one and two are negative, and the current is in, so it's it's negative. So there we have the relationship of the the uh, E uh, magneto magnetomotor force and the current. Now if we just substitute the terminal equation, so that we get the the magneto uh, magnetomotor magnetomotor force becomes the magnetic field over the permeability, lo and behold, this, this is just a discrete version of Ampere's law. And for the circuit, E, F, E, G, H, which is that F, F, E, J around here, uh, we use the fluxes, which are the cross variables. So this is phi 1 minus phi 2 minus phi 3 plus phi 4. But really, these are these were fluxes in into a closed region, and this is now just Gauss's law for the magnetic field, which is more clearly written in, in, in the form shown here. And finally, we get the magneto magnetic vector potentials. The last thing I'll, I'll cover here. So what we have here is uh, looking at nodes. Uh, E, F, and G, so we just go back to E, and there is the original current, and this is just the complement, we'll just call this the complement reflux, so that's the across. And looking at, and again here we have current complement reflux, current complement reflux, and this terminal graph here, it, it's across measurement is actually uh, phi y, is originally this direction. And this terminal graph here, it's a cross measurement, is the flux in the x direction. So considering the two circuits, G, F, E, and G, there is a G, F, E, and G, we get uh, phi F plus phi Y minus phi E. And for the other circuit, G, E, J, et cetera, we get phi E minus phi X minus phi J is equal to zero. Now replacing phi y with the magnetic magnetic field and an area, and replacing these complement refluxes with a measurement uh, a new new variable f and the thickness of the field h, and doing a little bit of work here, we get that the magnetic field in the y direction is just minus delta change in the variable a z over delta x. And doing a little work for the for B, bx, getting a sine rate, we get bx is the change in the difference in the a, uh, a, a, a variable over delta y. And in the limit, we get the sum of bx plus by, this, this relationship, this partial differential relationship. And lo and behold, that is just the b is the curl of a. And so the complement refluxes are the counterpart to the magnetic vector potential. <laughs> and I'm just in time here. We'll finish up with a couple of statements which I wanted to show, and that was that the graph theoretic field model is a discrete counterpart to classical spatial field theory. And the, again, the, the, it has shown the soundness of the principles of graph theoretic modeling in, in the sense that we've gone from the discrete model to classical models. And again, looked at showing how that it relates to some of uh, Maxwell's equations. And finally, the graph theoretic field model provides a unifying perspective for the common numerical methods. And I think that was my, my greatest happiness, was to show the relationship between finite difference and finite element. And with that, I'll end, and thank you. Uh, so the type of graphs you have shown are 
two D lattices, possibly deformed. And I was wondering if you uh, want to actually improve discretization over a certain region of uh, of, of your field. Is that possible? That does that bring additional challenges in terms of formulating uh, to this? to go three dimensions? Uh, so uh, no, no, even in two dimensions, let's say if you want to take just a piece of your lattice and actually add other oh. points in, oh, in no, that no, region. No, that's 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 quite easy. And in fact, I, I would take that that idea uh, in terms of the functional, where you begin to to uh, refine refine your your spatial structure until it becomes a continuum. Yeah. Thank you.